uh, let's dive right into the program. Uh, the battery market is changing historically uh, as far as kind of larger battery banks go. It's been a, a lead acid driven market. Uh, there are a few other battery types other than just lead acid and lithium ion. Uh, sodium batteries uh, kind of got some buzz over the past few years, although to my knowledge, the uh, sodium, the main sodium battery manufacturer, at least in the U.S., was named Aquion, and they went bankrupt a couple years ago. Uh, flow batteries are a like a, a, a large capacity, high efficiency battery. And uh, one of the, the main manufacturers of flow batteries, Red Flow, uh, a couple years ago announced that they were no longer going to target the residential market and only go after large capacity kind of utility scale batteries. And so as far as uh, uh, building goes, building integration, you're really choosing between lead acid and lithium ion. And there's a, a, a wide range of lead acid quality and also a, a range of lithium ion quality that we'll talk about today. Uh, but what we can see is that the, the lithium ion battery market share has uh, recently eclipsed lead acid. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best solution, um, but what it does kind of imply is that at least maybe uh, 10 years from now, uh, it'll be the clear market leader uh, as compared to lead acid. So that actually, that that results in a, a strategy that maybe you want to go with a lower cost lead acid today and not have a battery that lasts very long and then upgrade to lithium ion you know, 10 years from now when the price of lithium ion drops. You know, one thing that I think about when I look at these growth curves in the battery market is the, the cost of solar back when I got into the industry in 2008. Uh, in 2008, I remember buying uh, solar panels for over $3 a watt. It was actually like $3.15 a watt or so back in 2008. And, and nowadays when I'm buying solar panels uh, for the residential market from the distributor, I usually pay around 58 cents a watt or so, uh, sometimes less if I really go bargain bin hunting. And so what we've seen over a, a 10 year period is, is quite a drastic, you know, 80% drop, uh, if not more, in the, the cost of a solar panel. And this is with the uh, rather substantial import tariffs that are applied to solar today. Uh, and, and so lithium ion uh, may do the same thing, whereas right now we're kind of in a, a first generation lithium ion uh, product and not just the, the product, but the inverters and softwares and system integration that goes along with it. It's all just getting off the ground. So. You know, that is something to think about is maybe you don't want to be the early adopter and, and maybe even if uh, lithium ion is the superior technology uh, just in this moment in time, it may not be worth the cost. So, you know, there are customers who need to move forward with their projects in the here and now. And hopefully by the end of the day, we'll understand like what applications you should choose which technology for. Uh, different battery chemistries have different performance characteristics. And, uh, you know, they're, that means that they do have different applications. You know, lead acid uh, is not good for fully discharging your, your battery in a matter of minutes or a matter of seconds. You know, it, you know it, as we'll see when we get into reading our spec sheets, uh, lead acid really likes to be discharged over a period of about five hours or larger. Uh, the efficiency drops dramatically if you're trying to fully discharge a lead acid battery bank in, in a matter of minutes. Not that you can't do it. It's just that um, your, your energy costs are going to go way up through the rooftop. Lithium ion 
uh, can be discharged in a matter of minutes and still maintain its efficiency. Although we're still talking about periods of, you know, 30 minutes or 15 minutes or an hour, we're not talking about like one minute or 30 seconds or something like that. And so there are other forms of storage, rather it be supercapacitors or flywheels. Um, I do see supercapacitors coming to market in Australia. Uh, if you get on LinkedIn and you follow solar in Australia, there's companies out there that are putting in seven kilowatt hour uh, supercapacitors. And I, I don't know how they seem exorbitantly expensive. But what these supercapacitors can do is is uh, kind of smooth out the the second by second volatility in your uh, electric inflow and outflow. So maybe just a, a small supercapacitor uh, can help maintain some system efficiency, particularly on an unreliable or instable electric grid, uh, not the kind of grid that we really have in the United States. Uh, I have a cousin who's a um, elevator mechanic and they put flywheels in elevators to do kind of like the same thing as regenerative braking in vehicles. You think about an elevator, you know, it, it goes up to the top floor in a matter of seconds and then it drops back down to the bottom floor in a matter of seconds. And so they have to pick a storage technology that fits the application. Uh, whereas storing that power in, in lithium ion is not quite as efficient as a flywheel. You know, similarly, storing the power in a lead acid battery, it just does not have the uh, responsiveness of, uh, of lithium ion or flywheels. That said, you might not need and commonly you won't need the responsiveness of lithium ion or flywheels for building power storage. I mean, when you think about it, your, your maximum period of 15 minute peak load, it may actually occur not over a 15 minute window, but over a two hour window or over a three hour window, or at least even if it's, even if it's only occurring over a two hour window, you want to have the storage capacity of a five hour window just to be on the safe side. You know, the, the last thing you want to do is fully deplete your battery bank and then not have any reserve capacity available and your demand still being high. And so you've bought the battery and, and realized no cost savings out of it. So even for a, a commercial battery, it may be, a better strategy to go with a larger, less responsive battery rather than a smaller, more responsive battery. Um, and and you know the the one concept that I like to think about is well, can you combine multiple battery chemistries? Could you do a a large lead acid battery bank with a small supercapacitor just to kind of of uh, of level out the instantaneous spurts in power? Or could you combine uh, a large lead acid battery bank for your base load and then do lithium ion for demand management? And what I would say is that if you know how to program these battery inverters, you can combine multiple battery chemistries, except the inverter manufacturer will not warranty their battery inverters under that. So I've, I've yet to find a battery inverter manufacturer who will support their warranty when combining multiple battery chemistries together. That said, uh, when you look at your system costs, the cost of that inverter warranty may only be, uh, you, you might be talking about a, a $3,000 inverter and a $40,000 or even more uh, battery bank when you get into commercial demand management. And so for, for the extreme early adopters, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you say, well, I don't really care about the inverter warranty. I want to kind of piece together, you know, a system that is going to be uh, responsive to my facility needs. So I can kind of use my lithium ion as a, as a jump rope where my demand spikes momentarily and I discharge the lithium ion 
And then I have a, a separate inverter and a separate battery system for a, a lead acid base. Uh, but it's just not, that's something where the, 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 the actual inverter hardware and software is not currently set up for combining these technologies together, even though there, there could be some gains to it. You know, so when it, when it comes down to, well, which do I choose between lead acid and lithium ion, there is the capital cost consideration. And then there's also the system maintenance uh, consideration where a uh, lithium ion battery is a sealed battery. So when it operates, it doesn't emit water vapor. It doesn't emit gases. And uh, the, the lead acid technology, you can, you can get a sealed lead acid battery and the sealed lead acid batteries are common um, but the problem is we see that lead acid just by and large is not as responsive as, say, lithium ion. And the problem with a, a sealed lead acid battery is if you do indeed start discharging it quickly, it will want to produce gas and chemical reactions. And if that gas gets captured and sealed inside the battery, it, it leads to more degradation of the battery than if the gas were allowed to vent to the outside. And what happens with lead acid is you have to, there's a lot of evaporation. And so one of the big maintenance tasks of a lead acid battery is to water the battery. And we'll look at some watering systems in a little bit. Um, if you that water can be recaptured and recycled back into the battery uh the problem is it just ends up it, it assists the degradation of the lead acid battery and so a sealed lead acid battery has worse performance in a shorter lifespan as well as higher upfront cost than an unsealed lead acid battery and when we look at the maintenance of a lead acid battery, it really is not that big of a deal. Uh, so if you're going for low cost, low upfront cost and, and better performance and cost effectiveness, going with the unsealed lead acid batteries, that's kind of the, the cost leader as far as your upfront costs go. If you're going for no maintenance at all, and and maybe also not just no maintenance, but no off gassing. And so like if you're in an apartment building and you want to put your uh, battery in a uh, equipment closet, you know, you don't want <laughs> you don't have that that nice venting directly to the outside to atmosphere. And so you may be forced from your environmental regulations uh, or by the location of the battery itself, or by, you know, it's a high-end client and under no circumstance do they want to perform any battery maintenance. You, that's when you're selecting more of the lithium ion at this time. But say if you are, if you're doing an off-grid cabin in the middle of the woods and you just don't have the budget for a giant lithium ion battery bank, you go with lead acid uh, if you uh, are doing commercial demand management, but it's for an industrial facility that's out in the countryside in an open air kind of warehouse, you know, that would be another good time to consider lead acid. You know, if you're in the middle of the city in California, they may not allow you to do lead acid because of the off gassing. Uh, also, when we look at the performance characteristics between lead acid and lithium ion, you know, the, the, main, the main problem with lead acid is the lack of 15-minute of by 15-minute responsiveness. And so some of that can be uh, rectified by smart appliance selection. So if I'm doing an off-grid home design, I am not going to specify a tankless water heater because a tankless water heater can be a 20 kilowatt load that is instantaneously applied. So tankless water heaters are not appropriate 
for an off-grid lead acid cabin. At the same time, uh, a tank water heater that runs 24 seven, uh, it may use more energy over the long run than a tankless water heater, but it has a, a much lower power demand on the, the home facility. And so just through, through going with smart appliance selection, um, the, the shortcomings of lead acid can be overcome. Um, so, so there's, so it really comes down to not really what battery technology you want to use, but whether or not you are going with a sealed battery or an unsealed battery. And my my gut instinct tells me that if you're going with a sealed battery and it's it's larger, uh, lithium ion is something to look into, despite the fact that it still costs a lot more at this time, about you know two and a half times as much. Uh, so often, if your battery bank is small, you'll want to go with a sealed battery because it requires less maintenance. And so the smaller your battery gets, the more the the maintenance of a small battery bank doesn't make a lot of sense and you end up going with a, a, a more expensive top shelf battery technology to avoid the maintenance cost. Um, but the larger your battery gets, the more likely the customer is going to be willing to do some system maintenance, whether it be a, a manufacturing facility where there's already a on-site maintenance facility personnel available or an off-grid cabin in the woods where the homeowner is is living there uh you know on a regular basis uh, so it's really a, a question between a, a sealed and unsealed battery bank there's also another kind of uh vented unsealed battery technology called nickel iron. Um, and what I would say is nickel iron, it has very similar performance characteristics to industrial flooded lead acid. So even though it uses different materials, it's kind of in that, that lead acid uh, battery technology category. And these are very old technologies. So now we're getting into specification sheets and there's a, there's a couple of terms for a lead acid battery that we need to understand. There's called float, absorb, and bulk. And the, the difference is the float of a, of a vented battery, of a, main, of a maintainable battery, you know, the lead acid battery refers to the very top of the battery capacity. And at the very top of the battery capacity, um, you know, kind of in the, the, the you know, right, right here at the 20% mark, maybe in the, the 20, you know, I didn't really draw it, let me be a little bit more accurate, maybe in the, the 20 to 30% range, um, and then, then on up almost to the top. But what we can see is this is a asymptote that's kind of getting us all the way to the top. So the float is the, the, the top range of the battery. The absorb is the mid range of the battery and the bulk is the bottom range of the battery. And so perhaps the, the most important distinguishment is what's the when we talk about the mid range of the battery and the bottom range of the battery, what do we mean? And for that, we look at, at what's called a, a depth of discharge chart. And what this chart indicates is the number of cycles that we can get out of a battery based off how deeply we discharge our battery. And so in, in a sense, if a battery has double the capacity, it's going to be discharged half as much. And so we can kind of right size our battery by saying, okay, well, is there an ideal cycle level to our battery that we should not exceed? 
And so you might, if you know anything about lead acid batteries, you might have heard, oh, well, you shouldn't discharge a lead acid battery more than 50% or more than 30% or more than 80%. Or if you fully drain a lead acid battery, it's not going to charge back up again. And those are very kind of fast and loose rule of thumbs that almost give a, a wrong impression about lead acid because these two charts are actually two different kinds of lead acid batteries. There's a, a top shelf lead acid battery and then there's a, a mid-range lead acid battery and then there's, there's bottom shelf lead acid batteries as well. And what we can kind of look at is, is the sh that these two curves are different shapes. And what I like to look at is the, the difference between absorb and bulk is somewhat indicated by like where this straight kind of line starts to deflect. So that, that point of deflection in this curve is somewhat of a quality indicator that says this battery is the more top shelf battery and this battery is more of the, oh, sorry, the other way around, that this battery is more of the top shelf battery and this battery is more of the, the lower end. Where if we, we look at these two batteries in the manufacturer spec, it says, okay, on this, this kind of lower end battery, you don't want to cycle it down more than about 35% on a regular basis because once it gets into this deeper range, it's not that the battery won't work. It'll still provide power, but the, the, the life of the battery starts to uh, substantially diminish. Whereas on this battery, you're going to get a, a kind of a elastic, you know, if you think about like stress and strain curves of, of metal, that this straight line range is the elastic range of the battery. And then this bottom range is where the battery material gets strained and you see more degradation in that. And it's not, it's not exactly the same as stress and strain. It's really more of, of at, at what level of chemical interaction do you get more degradation in the battery anode uh, but what we can see is that within the, the flooded lead acid category, you can find flooded lead acid that can take all the way down to a 65% a depth of discharge on a regular basis. And then you can also get flooded lead acid that can only really take a 35% depth of discharge on a regular basis. And so there's a, a huge range in quality within the flooded lead acid category. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's something that we're gonna have to, to consider when we do a, a cost analysis of, do we go with a higher end battery uh, with a, a deeper cycle versus a lower end battery with a shallower cycle? And so I, the reason why I wanna point this out is because a lot of the lithium ion guys will say, oh, well, with lithium ion, you get a 100% depth of discharge so you can get away with a smaller battery bank. And while that is a true argument, you can also apply the same argument while staying within the flooded lead acid category to say, oh, well, if you go with a, a bottom shelf flooded lead acid battery, you're going to need a huge battery bank. But if you go with a top shelf flooded lead acid battery, then you could get away with a smaller battery bank. And so that's not really a, an issue of, of flooded lead acid versus lithium ion. It's more of an issue of using a top shelf battery versus a bottom shelf battery. You're going to get more range out of a top shelf than out of a bottom shelf. So that, that rule of thumb that says you don't want to fully discharge a flooded lead acid battery is true 
but just understand that there's a, a huge range in, in performance of top shelf versus bottom shelf flooded lead acid. And there are um, flooded lead acid battery banks out there where you can discharge them rather substantially before you have to worry about, oh, well, is this damaging my battery? And so what I would do, or what I commonly do in my off-grid designs is specify uh, a top shelf flooded lead acid battery and then program the control system to say, okay, before we get to the point where we're operating in the bulk range of the battery, you know, before we get to the point where uh, the battery is being strained, we're going to turn the generator on and, and charge it all the way back up to the top. And so the, the bulk range of the battery will actually have a different charge setting than the absorbed range of the battery. The bulk range is kind of the, the danger level of the battery. So you get down into the bulk range of your battery, you're going to want to turn that generator on and, and crank it really high and, and you know, really charge, get, get out of the bulk range as, as fast as you can. Uh, the absorb range, the generator setting is generally going to run for a shorter run time and be less aggressive to say, you know, okay, we don't have to run the battery for, you know, five hours. We might just run the battery for three hours and, and just get a little bit further up and down, you know, in, in this, in the absorb range of the battery, you can just kind of yo-yo your your energy levels back up and down and up and down without worrying about battery damage. And then we get to the top of the battery or the float of the battery. And when the battery is 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 fully charged up at the top of the range, similar to the absorb range of the battery, you're not getting too much degradation, even though the electricity is flowing through the battery. Um, if your battery's at full charge and your solar array is, is tied into the same bus as the uh, battery bank before you land on the inverter, you know, you have the, the, elect the voltage flowing through the top of those battery leads. Um, it's just it's not gonna be cycling or damaging the battery because you're not you're not draining it further down into you know its strained range. At the same time, we talked about this uh, yesterday. You might have a, a 48 volt battery, and that's just the the nickname of the battery. It's a 48 volt battery. It's a 12 volt battery. It's a 24 volt battery. You may be wiring a bunch of 12 volt batteries to create a 48 volt battery. But you go and you read the spec sheet and it'll say, well, this 48 volt battery bank is actually rated for a maximum voltage capacity of 60 volts. And you think, okay, well, that's kind of weird. Why, what, you know, why am I? why is my battery when it's at full charge it's closer to 60 volts than 48 volts but you'll never see your battery get all the way up to a 60 volt charge well what's happening in this this cycle and and depth of discharge chart you can see it, it kind of forms an acetope that goes further and further up what happens when you charge a battery all the way up to its its full 100%, you know, no depth of discharge capacity is that it it immediately starts to to self discharge and and drop back down where you you it you really can't maintain a flooded lead acid battery at a 100% state of charge and so we simply don't ever charge them all the way up to 60 volts. Um, we might charge them up to 54 or 55 volts. And then when they when they get down into this lower range is actually when they start getting into their, their 48 volt category. And then once they drop below 48 volts, uh, they really don't produce any power for your 48 volt applications. But 
we do get into kind of diminishing returns in terms of efficiency if we try and, and charge our batteries all the way up to 100% because that, that high voltage is going to want to press the electricity you know, back down into the appliances and, and not be able to store it in the battery very efficiently. Um, there's actually, you, there's only one circumstance when you charge your lead acid batteries up to uh, approaching that full voltage, and that's during the maintenance cycle of the battery, where you, in, in the maintenance cycle of the battery, you charge it to the top of the float range. You know, that's that's not what always you're going to do. If you're if you're in the absorb range and you click on your generator, you're really only trying to charge it up to the top of the absorb range or into the float range. But what you're not trying to do is charge it all the way to the top of the float range. Instead, you you cut it off when the voltage kind of gets into a, a, a more reasonable range. Uh, whereas the, the bulk state of charge, you just try and, and charge it a little bit longer, a little bit faster. When you, when you charge all the way to the top of the float, it just becomes an inefficient charging process. You put in way too much energy and you experience more efficiency loss accordingly. You charge to the top of the float during maintenance because it actually is going to uh, bust off plaque that that will plate and cover the anodes during chemical reactions. Uh, you have a, a solid that is is sticking down into some chemicals and electrons are flowing through uh, the solid into this liquid and that reaction is is causing a little bit of corrosion in the solid anode and it, it plates the anode and eventually that plating fully covers the anode and so electrons can no longer press through it. During a battery maintenance cycle, by overcharging the battery and driving it all the way up to the top of its voltage, you actually bust some of that plating off of the anode and it, it sinks down into the, the liquid. And so that's not something that you do all the time, but you really do it more often when you're operating the battery down into its full depth of discharge. And so you maintain your battery not all the time, you don't need to maintain your battery as much when you're operating in this kind of absorbed range of the battery. It's really only when you start cycling your battery down below where what it can take is when your more regular maintenance tasks occur. And so you will need to maintain your battery more frequently in the, the summertime when you have high air conditioning loads and in the winter time when you just don't have as much sunlight versus in the spring and in the fall when your your electric loads are low and your production is high and so you're just staying in the the top range of this this battery and so what what we want to take away with this slide is to understand there's three kind of distinct phases within a flooded lead acid or a, a, a vented battery that requires maintenance. There's the float phase, uh, which is the top of the battery where you're not damaging the battery when it's, you're using it and it's fully charged. Uh, you only go to the very top of the float during the maintenance cycle. Uh, there's the absorb phase, which is kind of the, the normal operating range that you want the battery to operate within. And then there's the bulk phase, which is the bottom of the battery. And that's if you're operating down at the bottom of the battery, that's when the battery is, is going to experience uh, the bulk majority of its degradation. And then there's there's lithium ion batteries. And uh, what I would say is it's kind of surprising when we think about like the, the Tesla battery, we think about a, a very high end battery. But actually, the 
a standard lithium ion battery is is the lower end of lithium ion technology. Um, it's it has fewer cycles and it's going to degrade more quickly than the top end, which is generally speaking uh, a technology that is referred to as lithium iron phosphate. Uh, and, and the main difference is the lithium iron phosphate anodes experience less degradation uh, than if they don't have the iron phosphate in the anode. And so uh, what happens is the lithium ion batteries have a shorter life, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. And in order to get that, that longer life, uh, there's also a higher production cost. And so there's a, a definitely there's a, a top range of uh, lithium ion technology, and you see this top range being used for very remote power applications or luxury markets where budget is not the issue, and the the client just simply wants to do the project once and have it last for thirty years without any maintenance. Uh, that's your your lithium iron phosphate customers, or even in extremely small applications like uh, you know maybe your your the movie industry uh, where they want you know they're using their their cameras on a day to day basis, but they don't require a tremendous amount of storage capacity. Uh, you know they they might go for something that's a little bit more longer lasting with a, a, a lower overall useful life, uh, but they're using it commercially so they can afford, you know, a, a top shelf battery uh, from the get go. But by the time it, it comes to uh, using a battery for a building, you know, that's a lot of storage capacity that you're going to need. And the, the cost, as we'll see, of lithium iron phosphate batteries starts to become kind of cost prohibitive. And so the, the major players in kind of the, the building lithium ion battery are Tesla and LG Chem, and Mercedes makes one as well. Um, LG Chem is, is kind of the, the, the open distribution line battery manufacturer, uh, whereas Tesla has a, a more closed installer network. Uh, LG Chem, it's, it's very easy to become an LG Chem lithium ion installer. Um, Tesla, they wanna make their own products. They wanna make their own inverters. And so if you're using a, a solar inverter, you're more likely to be specking out an LG Chem battery. And then uh, you get into higher end uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, that that lasts a bit longer, and uh, you know they usually will work with solar inverter manufacturers as well. So when I was doing um, an off grid design, uh, geez, I guess it was it was like a year and a half ago now. What we did is we we selected uh, a range of battery technologies and kind of looked at their cost and life cycle cost. And so we looked at a, a kind of mid-range flooded lead acid battery. And then we went and looked at a top shelf flooded lead acid battery. We also looked at the, the Tesla Powerwall 2. Um, we also looked at a ultra premium lithium iron phosphate battery that was made by Sony. And then we went and looked at the nickel iron battery technology as well. Then we went and looked at, uh, some system sizing. And this is kind of interesting, um, too. And we have to get a little bit further into our, our product selection to understand, you know, why this premium flooded lead acid line was 105 kilowatt hours versus the industrial flooded lead acid being 122. And we have to also understand how to, to kind of estimate the size that we need. Um, but just to start out with, what we're really constrained by is the upper limit of batteries that will fit on no more than two 
battery circuits. And uh, we'll get into the reasons why in a, a little bit. But within this particular premium flooded lead acid product line, the largest size battery we could wire together to fit our 48 volt configuration was 105 kilowatt hours. Whereas we had a little bit more wiggle room uh, within the industrial line. And so with the industrial line, we called up the manufacturer and said, well, what is your most popular industrial flooded lead acid battery? Uh, kind of under the assumption that the most popular one would be the, the best price point. Uh, Tesla Powerwall 2, you know, we, are, we were actually kind of setting our system size based off, uh, you know, a budget that's kind of akin to what the client was looking to spend with their industrial flooded lead acid. So we want just we wanted to do a comparison to say, OK, well, uh, if we spent around twenty five thousand dollars on a flooded lead acid, could we instead do the Tesla Powerwall 2? How much capacity would I would we get? And what would the user experience of a smaller battery bank look like? You know, the, the lithium iron phosphate, we just stuck on there for our comparative analysis to say, look, you know, it's it's the lithium iron phosphate for just a 42 kilowatt hour battery is so expensive that it just completely busts our budget and, and we're not going to be able to afford this. And that's not what the client was going to spend. So, you know, even though this is the, the top shelf, longest life cycle, maintenance free battery. Uh, the the capital cost is what really uh, killed it. And then we had a, a kind of a competitor to flooded lead acid called nickel iron. And it, it's also more expensive and would have involved a higher upfront cost, uh, except the, the depth of discharge is is rated at a at a at a, a much deeper depth of discharge for its its regular cycle and so then we get to okay what would our our depth of discharge be and i'm not i didn't put too much double checking into the lithium iron analysis because it we just kind of knew from the get go that that would have been a non starter so i don't i don't quite know uh, exactly how I calculated this amount. Uh, but what we kind of looked at was, okay, what was our what was our average depth of discharge for the Tesla Powerwall, for the nickel iron battery, for the industrial FLA, and for the premium FLA? How many cycles would we get out of it? And then what the levelized cost of storage would be. And so what we did was we took the, the upfront cost of the battery divided by, you know, if we, if we knew the, 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 in the size of the battery. So we looked at the size of the battery and the cost of the battery, multiplied those two together to get to the upfront cost. And then we said, okay, well, if we're going to be, if we have a 105 kilowatt hour battery, we go and do our energy analysis and we say our average depth of discharge for this 105 kilowatt hour battery is going to be a 30% depth of discharge. If we go and we do a 122 kilowatt hour battery, our average depth of discharge is only going to be 20%. Uh, the, the Tesla Powerwall 2 is actually rated for 100% depth of discharge at, uh, at, at 37,800 kilowatt hours. So their warranty is not based off the depth of discharge. It's just based off of the total energy output. And the reason is the, the lithium ions, they don't have that same stress strain curve where there's a, a operating range in the mid range and top range of the battery that you want to stay within. But if you get into the bottom range of the battery, you start to become less efficient with more degradation. You know, remember that the, the lithium ion battery is more elastic than the lead acid technology. And so you can fully discharge it 
and they don't really care about the operating range of the battery. They just say, hey, once you once you get this many kilowatt hours out of the battery, the warranty is up. And actually in that, that Tesla provided inverter, they're counting every single kilowatt hour that comes out of the battery and tracking it. So you look at their warranty and it'll actually say, you know, you won't get a depth of discharge curb for the Tesla Powerwall. Instead, they'll tell you it's for 100% and this is how much energy you can draw out of it. Technically speaking, you still can't fully discharge a lithium ion battery. If you fully discharge a lithium ion battery, it'll brick and not charge back up again. Tesla kind of plays a little game with their spec sheet where they, they actually will give you a little bit larger of a battery than what they say they're delivering you. Um, and, and so they, they keep a little bit of reserve capacity in that battery that you can't access to make sure you don't fully brick it by, uh, by fully depleting the battery. Uh, and then with our, our nickel iron battery, uh, the manufacturer said that it's rated for an 80% depth of discharge as well, and that they, they're more elastic than uh, flooded lead acid. Uh, although I wouldn't take that as there's there's much less market data available on nickel iron. So whereas the, the flooded lead acid technology types, you can do a lot of comparative analysis between different uh, flooded lead acid manufacturers and see similar performance characteristics. Uh, with nickel iron, you're really just taking the manufacturer's word for it because there's just a small range of, of manufacturers out there. And so what we did is we said, okay, well, what, what is the levelized cost of storage? You know, if, if my battery is going to cost this much money, you know, then I'm only using 30% of 105 kilowatt hours on a regular basis, or I'm only using 20% of 122 kilowatt hours on a regular basis. I need to know how many cycles of 30% or how many cycles of 20% I'm getting. And so that's where we go back and we actually use these depth of discharge curves. And so for our, um, you know, for our, our higher end uh, industrial flooded lead acid battery, you know, we're getting uh, you know, we see this this 20% range, uh, and we see that we get a lot more cycles out of it than our kind of mid shelf, uh, you know, premium flooded lead acid, where a 20% depth of discharge is only getting us 4,000 cycles and not 5,000 cycles. In other words, the the industrial flooded lead acid battery that is uh, $210 a kilowatt hour is rated for, uh, uh, you know, 20% more cycles than the premium flooded lead acid battery that is $160 a kilowatt hour. Okay, well, let's pull up our calculator here. And we go $160 and we want to add 20% to that. You know, that's still under $210. And so we could say, well, isn't using the, the premium flooded lead acid, isn't that still going to be less cost of, or more cost effective than 210 because 192 is, is less than 210? So if you miss that, let's go back a minute. You know, what we're trying to do is compare the industrial flooded lead acid battery versus the premium flooded lead acid battery. And we can say, okay, well, the, the premium flooded lead acid battery at a 20% depth of discharge is giving us 4,000 cycles. The industrial flooded lead acid, which costs 25% more, 
is giving us 20% more cycles. And so we're getting into, you know, if we do a incremental cost analysis, it would appear at first glance that the premium battery is more cost effective than the industrial. But what we need to go and, and analyze is to say, okay, well, you know, the premium lead acid battery is, is only giving us, you know, a, a 35% range until we start degrading the battery, whereas the industrial battery is giving us more of a, of a 60% range before we start degrading the battery. And so how often am I getting down into this lower end in order to do a, a very complete analysis? And so what we actually looked at is at 105 kilowatt hours, getting into this 30% depth of discharge range, you know, that's where we get our 2,750 cycles. And then we also compared it to doing a, a higher end industrial lead acid. And, uh, you know, this is telling us 5,000 cycles, but, but we went and, and kind of erred on the side of conservatism. Uh, I guess, for, for this analysis. And so looking at, at dividing the, the upfront cost by how many kilowatt hours, you know, 30% of 105, 20% of 122, uh, you know, or kind of assuming we can fully use our Tesla Powerwall at 37,800, yeah, we divide our, our upfront cost by how many kilowatt hours we're getting out of the battery. And kind of like ducks in a row, what we see is the, the um, higher our upfront cost gets per kilowatt hour, the lower our total operating cost gets with the exception of nickel iron. It kind of looks like nickel iron stands out in the pack in terms of uh, not costing nearly as much as lithium iron phosphate, but delivering the lowest cost per kilowatt hour in, in total life. And so uh, when I presented this to my client and say, okay, well, which battery technology do we want to go with? You know, the, right off the bat, the lithium ion battery is a, a non-starter because uh, it's too expensive. You know, the Tesla Powerwall, it really, at the time we were doing the project, it was not widely available. He would have had to go on a wait list. And so it really wasn't uh, a, a feasible solution at the time. But the other problem was the capacity was too small. And so we're going to get into generator runtime. You know, the, the problem with the Tesla Powerwall with this small capacity is it, it meant that we would have to run the generator more frequently. And one of the things that was important to this client is he says, OK, well, you know, I'm building this off grid house but I don't want to insert stress into my life. I don't want to have to listen to the generator and whenever it turns on, I don't want to think, Oh, I'm about to run out of electricity. And so the, the storage capacity of the lithium ion technology for the price was another limiting factor. You know, he looked at, at premium flooded lead acid versus industrial. And what was kind of important to him is he wanted a, a long lasting battery. And it was, was clear from the depth of discharge cycle charts that, you know, these are going to be in a, a similar operating cost range and the industrial flooded lead acid would last longer. And so, you know, he would, he preferred to spend more money on a lead acid battery bank that would last longer. He also is, uh, is not afraid of doing maintenance work on his property. And so the maintenance aspect didn't really bother him. Uh, a valid solution would have been to spend less money on you know, a, a lower end flooded lead acid. And even though it would have cost more per cycle, it also would have uh, crapped out 
earlier in the process. You know, it turns out that this industrial flooded lead acid battery is going to have a 30-year life on it, whereas the, the premium would have had maybe a 15-year life. And so, you know, maybe the, the better solution in terms of, of counting all of our dollars and cents would have gone for uh, the battery that costs less money only lasts 15 years, and then 15 years from now, we swap it out with a lithium ion battery that doesn't require any maintenance. Uh, but he didn't, you know, he wanted to just do the project once and then not have to worry about removing these big, heavy batteries uh, 15 years from now or 10 years from now. You know, he wanted to, to kind of get it out of the way and, and use something that was a little bit more top shelf. And so it kind of boiled down to, are we going to go with the nickel iron battery that looks like it has the, the lower um, cost or the industrial flooded lead acid battery that has less upfront cost but a higher operating cost? And his decision was, well, you know, the, the nickel iron battery is is the oddball you know there's there's not many manufacturers that support it you know really he didn't want to spend the sixty thousand dollars on his batteries uh you know when it when it came down to it the reason why he was willing to spend this amount of money on a battery bank is because the power company was going to charge him twenty thousand dollars to bring the power out to where he wanted to build his house and so he said, I have $20,000 to spend on a battery bank. You know, I know I want to do solar. I'm going to do solar anyway. You know, the power company that was charging him $20,000 to bring the power out to his property was not giving him a net metering policy. So he knew that if he did interconnected solar, it wouldn't be a very economic deal. So he said, I'd rather just store it in a, in a battery bank and spend $20,000 that I would have to spend anyway on grid connection to go completely off grid. And so at the at the end of the day, you know, he really wanted to choose flooded lead acid because it gave him the capacity that he needed to confidently live off grid uh, within a budget that he was willing to spend. And some of this is going to be more clear as we go through our sizing exercise on how we determined that we needed a battery bank that was this large and what we mean by generator usage and, and quality of life. So that's what we're going to get into uh, right now. All right. So this customer came to me and he said, I want to do an off-grid house. And I had never designed an off-grid house up until that point. And this, uh, you know, he's not a, a hippie who wants to live in a tiny house uh, in the middle of Colorado. You know, he he's, lives in Mississippi. He's a doctor with a wife and two kids in middle school. And, and they would all be very upset with him if he moved them into an off-grid house and they started to run out of electricity on a regular basis. Uh, so we wanted, you know, one of the, the, the issues is, is living off grid reliable? And in, on, on the one hand, I think that living off grid is, is more reliable than having grid connected electricity. I mean, you look at the, the fact that, uh, in Mississippi, we do, uh, above ground power lines. And so he would have above ground power lines coming out to his house. He lives in a rural area. He would be at the end of the distribution circuit. And, you know, while we don't lose power all that regularly out here, um, when a disaster hits, the grid is unreliable. And above ground lines are less reliable than underground lines. And so the ability to generate your own electricity right on your rooftop and store it on site in a battery 
that is much more reliable than having above ground power lines in a rural area. And some reasons why that is important from a policy decision make standpoint is eventually our goal in Mississippi is to form a, a power company for off grid customers. And one of the, the questions that the Public Utility Commission has is, well, is this really necessary because, uh, you know, we only grant these, these electric cooperative monopolies in order to provide cost effective, uh, reliable electricity to a region. And the, we have to be able to decertify the monopoly in order to sell electricity to an off-grid customer, not just sell them the equipment, but actually install the equipment and sell them the electricity like we're a power company. And one of the arguments that is, is successful with a public utility commission is to demonstrate that, uh, that your electric supply is more reliable than what the current power company can provide. And the, the current mentality is that, oh, well, solar doesn't work at night, and so it's not very reliable. You know, well, actually, you know, generating power on site, not transmitting it over the electric grid and storing it on site, it's that, that storage component was the missing key. And once you generate your own electricity and store it, it can be very reliable unless you mess up your design and you don't do enough solar or you don't do enough battery capacity. So one of our design assumptions going in was to say, well, this is new construction. We don't really know anything about his on-site electric use. You know, we don't have any experience doing off-grid, off-grid design. So if anything, what we're going to do is, is shoot from the hip and oversize the system rather than undersize the system. And whereas in, in grid connected solar, it's very important to kind of right size your equipment because, you know, hey, all this stuff is very expensive and you just don't want to overspend. You know, let's say you put a, a 10 kilowatt solar array on a 10 kilowatt inverter. Well, you might have been able to save a thousand dollars by putting it on an eight kilowatt inverter, and and because of 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 uh, heat loss and all the inverter loss and all the losses associated with solar, generally you will undersize the solar inverter as compared to the solar array because you never get up to your full array capacity. The, the array capacity, that 10 kilowatt array capacity, is based on a standard test condition uh, that's based on basically a 60 degree Fahrenheit day under full sun. And even on a 60 degree Fahrenheit day, uh, you only get full sun at high noon so it's it's very rare in the summertime in the winter time to ever get up when you know when you actually need the electricity to ever get up to your fully rated capacity and so we undersize solar inverters because it's cost effective to do so now with a battery if we oversize the battery what's going to happen is let's say we we are, are oversizing the battery and we, we aim for a 35% a depth of discharge, but we oversize the battery. And so instead we get a 25% depth of discharge. Well, what we can see is that at the 35% depth of discharge, we get 2,500 cycles. And at the 25% depth of discharge, we get you know around 3,300 cycles. And so our, our battery is going to last longer if we oversize it. So the, the worst case scenario of oversizing a battery is that your battery is going to last longer. You know, the, the worst case scenario if you undersize your battery is that you're going to be operating in this degradation range 
And so it's it's much worse to undersize a battery bank rather than oversize a battery bank. So, you know, our, our mentality was if we have the budget, we're going to err on the side of oversizing the battery bank. But we still need to know what the battery bank size is going to be. And all we have is the monthly consumption of the customer's existing home. Well, if we know how much power he's consuming on a month-by-month -month basis, then we can also know how much power he's consuming on a daily basis. And so we take the, the months of the year and his existing energy usage, and we divide by days in the month, and we can see that, hey, in January, he's using 48 kilowatt hours a day. In February, he's using 56 kilowatt hours a day. In August, he's using 74 kilowatt hours a day. And so that comes becomes back to where we say, well, what's the, the depth of discharge of the battery? And where I actually went and I modeled this and then updated the slides for the model, you know, what I can see is, uh, you know, here with the Tesla Powerwall, you know, there's going to be days where we're using 100% of that 67 kilowatt hour battery. Now, that's not the complete picture because our solar array is also going to be producing during this time. And so perhaps, you know, in, in August and September, you know, in July, when he's using these 70 kilowatt hours, maybe the solar array is on for one third of that time. And so maybe one third of these kilowatt hours come out of the solar array directly rather than coming out of the battery bank. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, well, we know how many hours there are in a day. And so if we know how many hours there are in a day, we can divide by 24 and get, say, okay, well, we get about two kilowatts of average power draw in January. You know, divide by 24 and we get about, you know, two point, I don't know quite what it is, let's just say 2.2 kilowatts of power draw in February. Yeah, you know, we go in, into August and divide by 24, and what we see is we get about three kilowatts of average power draw in the summertime. And so our average power draw from winter to summer is ranging between 2 kW and 3 kW. Of course, that kind of assumes that, um, let me fast forward a couple of slides here. That kind of assumes that our two kilowatt power draw is completely flat. You know, from, from midnight to midnight, we have a, a perfectly even power draw. You know, from in the, here in the summertime, from, from midnight to midnight, we have a perfectly even power draw. And that is simply not the case. You know, in the, in the wintertime, if you have electric heat, that electric heat's going to to turn on in the, you know, ramp up in the morning. And then it's going to scale down as your home heats up. And then maybe you get home from work and turn the heater back up and kind of coast through the night as well. And so you let the home kind of cool off when you're not at home. And then you turn the heat back on through the night and really into the morning so you're not bone cold in the morning. And then in the summertime, it's kind of the opposite where, you know, you're going to be running your air conditioner during the hottest times of the day more hard than at night. And, of course, this is where, uh, uh, you know, solar thermal and passive solar and energy efficiency comes in where, you know, hey, do you put solar mass into your house so that you can you know, run the air conditioner more consistently 
and maybe, you know, chill thermal mass at night so that your home remains cool during the day and so that you have a more even air conditioning load. You know, can you get a, a variable speed air conditioner so that, you know, when your, your home power uh, becomes uh, uh, higher than what it should be, you can kind of ramp down the air conditioner? Do you have a control system with a smart thermostat so that when your power level exceeds a certain amount, you dial back the thermostat? You know, all this stuff is possible, except the, the home automation hardware really isn't advanced yet enough to, to fine tune this experience. There's, there's a lot of automated stuff out there for uh, kind of day trading your electricity. Oh, we're on a time of use rate. And so the thermostat's going to dial back and then the time of use rate's gone. And so the thermostat will dial up. Uh, you can on these commercial settings uh, do peak demand management where the, uh, the solar array reads the electric consumption of the building and it says, okay, well, we're, we're above a certain power draw. And so that's when we turn on the battery to kind of match the power draw so that we shave off the peak. And that's kind of a, a setting on the, uh, on the battery inverter itself. But what we, what we also assume is that, okay, we know that it's not just going to be an average power draw throughout the day, that it's going to vary. And so how do we know what our exact customer load profile is going to look like? How do we begin to kind of accommodate that? Because if I can show that, you know, hey, this, this analysis is not for Mississippi. This is like for Pennsylvania where you have a, a cold winter and a hot summer and then a spring and a fall that are kind of in between. Sometimes you're using the air conditioner. Sometimes you're using the heater. You know, a lot of homes in San Francisco don't have air conditioners because it just doesn't get that hot uh, in San Francisco. And so this is something that's going to vary by region. Sometimes this data you already have access to, where if you log in to your uh, electric account with your utility, if you have a digital meter installed on your home, the utility should be able to provide this data to you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I get a little upset with my utilities out here in Mississippi because they have this data, but they don't provide it to the customers. And so whenever I do solar installs, they call my customers to say, oh, well, you know, your power level is going to be at this amount and your outflow is going to be that amount. And so they they kind of do their own economic analysis of what they think the solar array will be to talk my customers out of doing solar. Uh, and at the same time, they don't provide the customer or myself with access to the same data, even though they charge the customers for the meter fees. It's kind of playing with a loaded deck, but that's not really the point. You know what, There, you can use sizing software to estimate what the load profile is going to be. And the way you do that is to say, okay, well, what region of the country am I in? Am I in the South? Am I in the North? You know, do I have a cold winter? Do I have a hot summer? And then the other aspect is what electrical devices are in my home. Now, with net metering, you never had to consider this stuff. With net metering, it's uh, how much electricity do you, use, do you use each year? What's the size of your solar array? Okay, I want to do a solar array that knocks out 100% of my annual energy use. You know, this, this it's almost like the industry is coming full circle back to where we're doing more detailed energy analysis and, and have to have a better understanding of, of what time of day I'm using my energy and might I be able to do any load shifting um, to, to better match up my solar production with my site consumption. Because say in the summertime, you know, my, my solar production is gonna 
closely match my load profile. So I might not actually be using my batteries so much. You know, it's really in the winter time when my solar production is in the middle of the day and my energy use is, is in the evening and at night. That's really where the, the critical factor comes into play. Except in, in our case, my, my customer said, well, right now I'm using electric heat, but when I build this off-grid home, I'm doing wood chip heat. And so, you know, I have my electric bill now with electric heat, but I don't know how much electricity is attributed to my heater. And so I don't know if this electric bill is going to be anywhere near what my brand new energy efficient home with not electric heat is going to use. And so to, to kind of get, get answers or at least best guesses to this information, you know, what we did is we, we knew his, all we knew was his monthly electric use and whether or not he has a swimming pool or an electric heater or uh, air conditioner or what kind of water heater does he use? What kind of light bulbs does he use? And this is a, a software called Aurora. And what they've kind of keyed into is that, hey, within a given region, certain residential load profiles look the same. I mean, you're going to have everyone's electric use is, is different. People who work from home versus people who work in an office are going to have different load profiles. But, hey, we have to, we have to make some assumptions somewhere. What they do is they take your your month by month electric use and then they divide it by days of the month and kind of say, okay, well, we're going to have this much energy use throughout your average day in the month. And then based on how you fill out a survey of your electrical devices, this load profile will actually change. So if you say, oh, I don't use electric heat, I use gas heat you know, all of this orange area will, will disappear. And so now your load profile, uh, instead of looking like a, a mountain in the morning and in the evening, now your load profile is going to be a lot flatter throughout the winter time. And, and, you know, potentially if we can get rid of our electric heating, then we can get away with less solar production in the winter and more solar production in the summer and have it more closely match our devices. Now, in our uh, off-grid case, we said, well, you know, wood heating is, is perfectly good, except you're going to have to shovel wood pellets into your heater, and, and that might get annoying. You know, what would happen if we oversized the solar array? And so in the winter time, let's say we just grossly overshot what we what we thought that we would need. Well, what that would mean is you wouldn't need to use your wood chip heater all that often. And in fact, you know, even though electric heating is is perhaps less efficient, you know, maybe we strike a balance where in the uh, the winter time, if our battery bank is full and our solar production is is above what we need you know maybe during that time we run our electric heater and then during other times we run the wood chip heater so that you get a, a quality of life improvement and so i'd say that 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 is something you need to consider with off-grid design is that you know there's there's really no problem in an off-grid house of having too much electricity and too much battery bank other than the the budget consideration, you know, it's it's much worse to run out of electricity. Now that would also kind of indicate that off grid is really only for uh, the rich, because you've otherwise, you know, the the grid connection is the most cost effective way to go, and to some extent that's true, except, you know, there's there's I, the guy who brought me into the solar industry uh, specializes in tiny houses in Colorado. And 
what's very common in Colorado is to buy a very cheap piece of land where there's no access to any utilities. And bringing power out to the property would be exorbitantly expensive. And so no matter what you do, uh, the the off-grid rig is going to be more cost-effective than bringing power out to the property. And what he says is, it's actually kind of interesting that his tiny house off-grid customers get away with very small battery banks and very small solar arrays because they they get into actively managing their electricity. So I do believe there is kind of an effect of when you live in an off-grid house, you are more conscious of your energy use and therefore you are going to be more conservative uh, with your electricity use. That said, wife and two kids in middle school, we're not trying to be conservative in this model. Okay, so what, we, what we've assumed is that we figured out how to kind of guess at his average power draw, which is we take his monthly bill, we divide by the days of the month to get the daily average, we divide by 24 hours in the day to say, okay, well, he's using two kilowatts of power on average. And that might mean at some times he's using a half a kilowatt of power like in at 3 a.m. in the morning when the heater's not running. And then in the middle of the day, you know, especially in the summertime, the air conditioner clicks on at the same time they're using all their uh, stereos and televisions and, and then they turn on the electric stove and maybe their power surges for a moment to get up to 10 kilowatts. You know, what we did to kind of guess what is maximum power usage would be, he didn't have this kind of real-time data, but my parents live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they did have access to this, and they had very similar devices. They had, uh, you know, they were going to, they're on gas heat, and they are, they live at home, and the, the summers in Tulsa are as harsh, if not harsher, than the summers in Mississippi and the winters in Tulsa are likewise. And so what I did is I looked at my parents' home and I said, well, my parents are getting up to 14 kilowatts in, in power demand in their home. And so I want to make sure that the system is designed to supply at least 14 kilowatts of power. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is that they're only getting up to this 14 kilowatt mark for 30 minutes at their time of maximum power usage for the year. And so that doesn't mean I need an inverter with 14 kilowatts of power output capacity. You know, the inverters, when we look at their spec sheets, they'll give you a 30 minute and even a 30 second output capacity and then a continuous output capacity. And so, you know, we could have gotten away with a five and a half kilowatt inverter. We use two of them and we look at their 30 minute surge rating and it was above 14 kilowatts. And we say, okay, well, you know, if we use these two inverters, you have 14 kilowatts of surge capacity, you're gonna be just fine for your energy use. We ended up instead selecting two 6.8 kilowatt inverters instead of two 5.5 kilowatt inverters. And it was simply because uh, the, the 6.8 kilowatt inverters that were slightly larger uh, only cost a little bit more than the five and a halfs. And so we didn't really see you know, the, the install cost, the labor cost, the design cost is all the same. And so we just didn't really see much uh, uh, disincentive to oversize the inverter capacity in this case. Again, we were, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, let's say he wants to do a, a more electric heat 
or maybe an electric vehicle charger down the road increases electric use and you know maybe he wants to have a hot tub or a water fountain or something um you know he would rather rather just spend a little bit more and give him an over capacity rather than just go right up to his maximum capacity because he had the budget for it So then we get into our, we have our, our month by month consumption. And this is where we go and we pull up PV Watts. So let's do a PV Watts calculation and then we'll take a, a break. Now we looked at PV Watts yesterday. I'm going to put the link into the chat so you can kind of do it at home. Follow along. I'm going to put in Starkville, Mississippi. And in this case, with PV Watts, you know, what, what I recommended yesterday was to do a, a one kilowatt solar array and just to, to keep the numbers there because it's going to be a conservative estimate. And what we can see is, is one kilowatt produces 1,427 kilowatt hours a year. I go back to his his month by month electric bill and I see that he uses 17,100 kilowatt hours a year. So I take my calculator and I go 17,100 divided by 1.4, you know, oh, to do a a net metered solar array, he would only need a 12 kilowatt system. And so let me go into PV watts and I'll plug in a, a 12 kilowatt system. And at this point, I might take the time to say, okay, well, in this case, it's going to be a roof mount. Uh, it's going to face south. The tilt angle, you can kind of mess around with that. You know, we went with a, a, like a 412 rooftop. Um, you know, for a grid tied system, I'm more aggressive with these numbers, but uh, this is off grid, so I'm still going to be kind of conservative with my energy estimates. I can actually see for my my 12 kilowatt system, I'm producing 16,780, and I was I was trying to go for 17,100, and so I go back and say, okay, well, what would 12 and a half kilowatts be? Okay, well now I'm over 17,100. But I also have my, let me kind of do a split screen here. Let's see, how can I do this? So here's my monthly consumption data. And then here is my PV Watts data. And what I can see is that in the month of January, I'm using 1500. And here I'm only producing 1100. And then I go down into the summertime. And here in the summertime in the month of July, I'm using 2200. And then here in my PV Watts data, in the month of July, you know, I'm only producing 16,800. And so what I want to do is, is in PV Watts, you know, it, it, I'm not designing on an annual basis to produce as much energy as I'm consuming. What I'm designing is on a on a month to month basis and really on a daily basis, how much energy I'm taking out of my battery bank, I want to fill back up. And so I'm going to start out with, you know, I what I did is I went and I plugged in, say, an 18 kilowatt solar array. And I go and I look at my PV watt state and I say, OK, well, now in January, I'm producing 16,050 kilowatt hours. So I'm overproducing in January and that's good. And I'm overproducing in February. So that's good. And then March and April and May, I'm way overproducing. I'm producing way too much electricity. And that's just something you have to deal with. 
with off grid is in the spring and in the fall, you're going to overproduce. And it's really in the, the summer and winter that you have to examine. And so we see in, in July, now I'm producing 2,400 and here in July, 2,200, 2,300. So it actually looks like my 18 kilowatt solar array is a little bit oversized, except that would be assuming that my daily average consumption is equal to my daily average production. And that's not true. I mean, you got your weather systems coming in. And so in the winter time, I'm going to have sunny days and I'm going to have overcast days. But I have to take into account the overcast days. And even in the, the summertime, I might get a hurricane come in off the coast and the clouds get all the way up to North Mississippi. And so I might go, I might have a one week period where I get stormy weather blowing in and impacting my electric load. And I have to take into that into effect. And that is where PV Watts becomes very useful. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of PV Watts, you get the hourly production data. And the hourly production data will take into account cloudy weather and sunny weather because it's all pulled from local weather monitoring stations. And so here we have uh, beam irradiance and diffuse irradiance. And this is a, uh, the beam irradiance is a, a sunny day and the diffuse irradiance is a cloudy day. And the thing about diffuse irradiance in cloudy days is there's a, a wide difference in cloudy days. You can have thick clouds and you can have thin clouds. And sunlight will actually get through thin clouds and you'll still get production out of your array on overcast days. It's just on the, the heavy overcast days. So I can actually scroll down and this is January 1st. And I can kind of see that it's a, a sunny day. And then January 2nd is a sunny day. And then January 3rd is a sunny day. You know, let me, you know, here's January 5th. And it's kind of a, a partly cloudy day where I have more diffuse irradiance at, at certain times. And, and here's a, a day where it's only diffuse irradiance but I still get some diffuse irradiance. Now here's a day where I get even less diffuse irradiance. And so it's like, here's day one of cloudy weather, day two of cloudy weather, day three of cloudy weather. And then at the tail end of day four, the sun comes back out. And then at day five, the sun comes back out. Now here's the deal. Even, even on a day where you have no direct irradiance at all, and it's all diffuse irradiance, you're still going to get a little bit of power out of your array. I mean, this is our 18 kilowatt solar array, and in the middle of the day, I'm still getting one and a half to, to three kilowatts of power. And so in the middle of the day for a, a one, two, three, four, maybe five, six hours you know, maybe for seven hours of the day in the winter time on that overcast day, I'm still running off of solar power. It's just for the remaining third of the day, my batteries are draining. And then on the next day, it's kind of the same thing. I might be running. This is a little bit. This is this is a, a overcast day, but it's it's thin clouds rather than thick. And so I'm actually running off solar for one, two, you know, three, four, maybe five or six hours a day. And then I'm charging it for another two, except I'm, you know, that's still only one third of the day. And so I can go and look at my PV Watts data and get an hour by hour output of my system. And then I can go in to my PV Watts monthly consumption, which I've converted into a daily average, which then I divide by 24 and get into an hourly figure. 
and go into PV watts and say, okay, this is my AC system output in watts. And so I can make a column for AC output in kilowatts by dividing by a thousand. And that's my solar production. So I might say production in kilowatts. And then I'd go and I'd have a different column for consumption in kilowatts. And then I'd go and put in, okay, in, the, in January, I'm averaging two kilowatts a day. And then I have a column that would be my difference where I subtract the two. And so, you know, not just copying it, but doing a, a cumulative. So it's, it's, you know, the, where I'm at plus my production minus my consumption, you know, now I'm getting my difference and each one of these lines is, is one hour. And so this is my kilowatt hour column. And I can do this for, you know, the entire year. And this is, you know, I'd have to go in and customize it for each individual month. This is just assuming a, a two kilowatt average power draw. And then I can go in and look at my minimum level. And you would think, okay, well, I'm, I'm a, let's see, where did this fall short here? Oh, I'm still falling and falling and see now I'm at 14 kilowatt hours and then um, I'm adding to and subtracting to so my battery is maintaining its state of charge and then I'm adding four and so now I'm charging my battery back up. Well, then I have to go, then I get up to 70 kilowatt hours. The next day I'm shrinking back down. I'm at 100 then it's charging back up. Well, let's go back into that that cloudy weather day and so here we're at in a sunny day a sunny day and then we start getting into the january 6th january 7th and now we're in january 8th so we're kind of going through our january 9th we're going through our cloudy weather days and so i go back to my battery bank and i say okay well how far up did my state of charge get 150. Well, I'm not buying a $150, a 150 kilowatt hour battery bank. You know, what I have to do is, is modify my formula and make sure that I'm not exceeding. In our case, we bought a 122 kilowatt hour battery bank. And so, you know, I need to go in and make sure that, you know, and the way that you would do that is say, use your Excel formulas. You know, if this column is greater than uh, 122, then make it 122. Otherwise, keep going and, you know, change your column like that. So I'll often just go up to the top and make a cell for my, you know, battery capacity. And make it 122 kilowatt hours and then use Excel formulas to, um, you know, kind of hard code it. And, and the, I'm not going to do the, the complete model here, but you, by using Excel, you can hard code this data so that your battery capacity never exceeds the maximum that it should and so now we see yeah you know, we have to we have to go in and make sure that <laughs> it still never gets above 122 regardless and so now we start to see our battery bank drop back down and then it gets fully charged again, and then it starts dropping back down.
And so what we're doing in this exercise is modeling the battery capacity for every single hour of the year based off the actual performance of the solar array and also based on the actual size of our battery bank. And so what we can see is now we're getting into the cloudy weather system and what was a 120 kilowatt hour battery bank only has three kilowatt hours left, only has two kilowatt hours left. You know, now we're at a, a negative six deficit. You know, let me just kind of extend this on down a ways, see how deep we go into our deficit. And we're getting into, you know, minus 30. And so what we could do is one of two things is one, we could increase the size of our battery bank and say, okay, well, we need at least 150 kilowatt hours. Otherwise, we're going to run completely out of power. And for that matter, uh, we don't want to discharge our battery bank more than 80%. And so 150 divided by uh, uh, 80%, you know, we really want 180 kilowatt hour battery bank. Or we can say, okay, well, as soon as we get down to, you know, uh, 80% or 20% of 120 is 24. As soon as our battery bank dips below 24 kilowatt hours, we're going to turn the generator back on and, and charge it all the way back up to the top again. And that way we've turned the generator on and we've recharged our battery bank. And so by, by doing this exercise, we can go from monthly consumption to what our daily average consumption will be. And then we combine that with PV Watts to kind of hone in on what's the appropriate array size so that we fill our batteries back up every month. And then we might even want to oversize the solar array beyond that. So we saw that a, an 18 kilowatt array would produce our monthly production for what we needed, but we might actually want to go and do even larger than that in order to say, well, on those overcast days, that's what we really want to design around. And here's the kind of secret to making this all cost effective is when I do solar designs, I always force my customers to buy by the pallet. I don't do custom designs for a, a rooftop. You know, I say, okay, you're either going to do one pallet of solar panels, two pallets of solar panels, or three pallets of solar panels. And, and that's because it, it just improves your shipping logistics and your cost. You get a lot. That's how you get below 60 cents a watt for your pricing is to, to buy by the pallet. So in our case, the, the next pallet size up was 22 kilowatts. And so we went and adjusted the PV watts figure for a 22 kilowatt system. And, and, and then we went and selected a generator. And at the end of the day, what that got us to was a, a graph where what you can see is here I've, I've visually displayed what we just showed you on screen where here's that cloudy weather system where the battery level goes from 120 to lower and lower and lower and lower and then the sun comes back up and then it gets lower and lower and lower and lower and then the sun comes back up and it recovers. And here's in the spring, and this is in, in March and in April and May, where our consumption is, is so much less than our production that our battery is operating at the top of that float. And so we're really not running our battery or cycling our battery. You know, here we're cycling our battery down to, to 50%. Here, we're only cycling our battery to 20%. And so that gives us an average cycle throughout the year 
of around maybe 30%. And so then we can go back to our depth of discharge curve and say, okay, well, for my off-grid house, you know, even though sometimes I'm getting down into the 50 or 60% range, you know, there's a lot of times when I'm just up here in this kind of top range and my average is in this 30% range. And so if I'm averaging a 30% depth of discharge, my cycles are going to be 4,000 cycles. And so finally, we get back to here we're going with our 122 kilowatt hour battery. We go through our bid process and it turns out to be $200 a kilowatt hour. And so we know our upfront cost, our average depth of our, our cycles, our average depth of discharge, and then our total levelized cost. So, uh, you know, basically you use PV watts and your monthly electric bill to hone in on your array size, and then you export it into Microsoft Excel and finish your model out. And then you cheat by assuming that once the batteries deplete to uh, a certain level, you're going to have a generator click on and charge the batteries all the way back up to the top. All right, so uh, kind of getting back into yesterday's discussion, uh, when you design battery solar arrays, one thing to keep in mind is they're a lot more flexible than, than what you think. Uh, I have found that a certain manufacturer might say that their, their system is not compatible with others and really what they want you to do is is stay within their product line um but when you go and you you talk with say the the battery inverter manufacturers they often say oh yeah you can just ac couple our battery inverters right next to an existing solar array it's generally the solar companies uh that want you to use their battery inverter alongside their existing system but the the problem is not all solar companies have off-grid projects so products i i'd say solar edge is probably the out in front of saying solar edge says we do not support our system for off-grid you have to use uh, our system for grid connection and they'll sell you a battery inverter but their battery inverter is really only for protecting critical loads. They don't warranty their system for an off-grid purpose. And they don't provide an inverter for off-grid, which means that, you know, technically speaking, you will void your Solar Edge inverter warranty by using it in an off-grid setting. But that doesn't mean it won't work in an off-grid setting. I mean, your, your Solar Edge, just regular non-battery inverter, you know, it's looking for a grid signal as long as your battery inverter uh, provides a, a pure sine wave grid signal. Your Solar Edge inverter doesn't know the difference between the battery inverter versus the grid signal. It's more just a, a impact of Solar Edge wanting to make sure that your battery inverter isn't backfeeding its inverter system or that its inverter system might be backfeeding uh, your battery bank. And so, you know, they don't want to be responsible for the fact that if you go and you use a battery inverter that doesn't have uh, frequency shifting, where if the battery banks are full, if you're, it has to be able to shift the frequency to turn off the solar array, and if it doesn't, things could go haywire. And I guess one reason why that's important is that when you select your generator, uh, there are generators that are, are specifically built 
to be compatible with renewable systems. And what, what these generators are, are basically variable speed generators uh, that will throttle up and down based on the load rather than just supplying uh, a constant, you know, more, more stable power output. So they're, they're energy efficient. Now, I don't really know how important it is to actually use a renewable generator on an off-grid system. I think that a, a renewable generator is more important if you are trying to use your solar array in an off-grid setting. So that if your solar array is providing, if your battery-less solar array, you know, let's say you have a solar array on your home and a hurricane comes in and knocks out your power grid, you might think to yourself, okay, well, I'm going to go and buy a generator and flip the main breaker on my service panel and crank the generator and provide a grid signal to my solar array. And then I'll turn my solar array on and run my home off solar and just let my generator kind of sit there idling. You know, for, for that level where you have your load jumping up and down and you have your solar array that's providing some power, but then a cloud might come over and drop the power capacity of your solar array, you would want a variable speed generator that can throttle up and down based on the load. But really, it's the, the battery capacity and it's the, the, the range of the battery capacity is also serving that purpose to be able to take any surplus power from a generator or surplus power from a solar array and, and use it to, to store in the battery. It's when you don't have a large battery is when you want that variability in your generator. So, you know, I'm just telling you anecdotally, uh, we had kind of a problem with our renewable generator on this off-grid site because you have a hundred different settings in your battery inverter, and now you have a generator that has a hundred different settings. And, and what we were doing was auto-starting the generator and trying to get it to charge up the batteries. But because our solar array had enough power to supply the home, the generator didn't see any need to uptick and, and throttle upwards to charge our batteries. It said, okay, well, the, the, all the load is being supplied, so I don't have to output any power. And it was just sitting there idly when our batteries were like at 50%. Whereas if we had a dumb generator that just turned on and outputted as much power as it possibly could, you know, you have, what I'm trying to say is you have a generator control system built in to these off-grid battery inverters. And so you don't necessarily need a generator that provides its own control system on top of that. In fact, you could be overcomplicating it by specifying you know what say generac says is their generator for an off-grid system and so uh you know i'd say not even not even the generator companies know exactly what the best configuration is for a generator in a battery in a solar array and it really depends on if you're trying to get away with a small solar array with a small battery that might make your generator run more efficiently when it's in use, which might be very useful in a place like Puerto Rico, where, you know, it's, it's the grid has been obliterated and, you know, they, they have some generators, but the problem is, uh, you know, you have to provide gas to those generators. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to assist the generator with a solar array and a battery. And for that, a variable speed generator is very important. But if the generator is 
not being assisted by the solar array, but the other way around, that the generator is there to kind of back up the battery, then you don't necessarily need a, a fancy generator. So that, that means uh, there's, there's a lot of components that are built into or added onto a battery inverter that you don't get with just a plain old solar inverter. Uh, for one, a plain old solar inverter takes the, the array power and outputs it through the inverter into the load. It doesn't take an input to charge up the batteries. And so a battery inverter is going to be more expensive than a solar inverter because it goes in both directions and not just in one direction. So a battery inverter is bi-directional, whereas a solar inverter is not. Now, I suppose you could have a battery inverter that is built for DC coupling and is not bi-directional, where it just gets charged from the solar array and not from the grid, although I haven't come across one yet that is, is like that. Some battery inverters are built for uh, either the European market on a 230 volt or 50 hertz signal or like the Australian market. Some battery inverters are coming from small cabins that might only be on 120 volts. Um, or like RVs that are on 24 volt batteries with 120 volt outputs. And so, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking about like SMA, they make a 120 volt battery inverter. And so sometimes you have to add a 240 volt transformer on top of that. You know, there's not a lot of um, 240 volt off-grid only inverters and the uh, what what might be nice about an inverter that is not listed for a grid connection is it it simply it might be cheaper than an inverter that has gone through the ul listing process and has all these safety provisions built into its hardware and software uh, to disconnect from the grid during an outage and transfer onto a critical load panel you know you could avoid uh some of that stuff if it's off grid likewise code compliance you know there there's uh you know, local AHJ jurisdictions that require external disconnects and external transfer switches. And you might be able to get an off-grid inverter that has all of that stuff built into the inverter cabinet itself. But if you tried to use the, those components, you wouldn't get through a grid-connected inspection. Not that they are in violation of national electric code, but they might be in violation of standard interconnection requirements from the utility. And so in some cases, you might say, well, if I know I'm going with off-grid, I don't want to have to spend the money unnecessarily for components that I don't really need with an external service panel and an external transfer switch and this anti-islanding stuff. You know, I just want to buy a, a cheaper battery inverter. Well, then you might have to, if you're, if you're designing the home for 240 volt split phase service, then you might end up buying a transformer on top of that. And transformers, not only is that an additional failure point in the system, but they also produce noise. So your battery inverters can produce more noise than your solar inverters, which are uh, generally quiet. Your battery inverters have multiple modes of operation in them. And so like the, the Schneider inverter can be used for off-grid. It can also be used for grid connection, and grid-connected battery inverters are used in different ways. It might just hang out and switch to a critical load panel during a power outage. In Hawaii, uh, they to interconnect a, a solar array to the grid, 
you have to put it into a zero export mode so that it can still receive power from the grid, but it won't push power out onto the grid. And then in commercial design, you would have it be in a demand management mode where it's monitoring how much power comes in from the grid and then running the battery to make sure your amperage draw stays within a predefined threshold. And then there's another mode of operation where you want to prioritize using the battery rather than using the grid. You know, maybe it's it's actually in the long run more expensive to use the battery, but the customer, you know, they're they're paying for it to reduce their electric bill. So even though at the end of the day, it might cost them a little bit more money to cycle the battery versus buy electricity from the grid, you know, they they want to use it. They would rather spend more money up front and reduce their electric bill rather than and, and know what their bill is going to be rather than some other more cost effective configuration. And also the, the monitoring systems of these battery inverters are more complicated uh, for those reasons. You may not just be monitoring the production out of the solar array. You may also be monitoring the uh, current that flows through your main service panel like in the case of load management, you have to be able to monitor the electrons out of your service panel. You're also monitoring the electrons out of the battery itself, such in the case is your, your Tesla inverter that's counting the kilowatt hours that come out of it. You're also monitoring the temperature of the battery, uh, which helps the, the inverter not pull too much power out of the battery. And in fact, you'll get into uh, additional specs on the battery where uh, if it's if you need to shed some circuits because you're drawing too much power, you can turn off auxiliary circuits. Uh, likewise, there's features where if your batteries are at a full state of charge, you'll turn on certain circuits that might not otherwise uh, come into play. Uh, a, so that you avoid overcharging your battery, or B, so that you can use the power that you might not otherwise use. So like you could have a, a water feature on your property where you have a, a water fountain in your yard that turns on only when your batteries are at a full state of charge and you're producing surplus power that you're not using to kind of visually indicate to the customer you know, hey, you're you're at a healthy state of charge right now. Uh, now is a good time to use more electricity uh, rather than other times. You know, uh, so you know to, to assist your customer with energy management. Here's something that we ran into that I did not expect in our off-grid design with batteryless solar. You're designing around a National Electric Code upper limit of 600 volts. And so you're wiring your modules positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, up until a 600 volt cutoff. And so that would mean we would have about eight circuits for our 22 kilowatt solar array. Well, a lot of off grid products are. It's it's weird, but the charge controllers are not for 600 volts. They kind of come out of an industry where, uh, you know, solar modules were more expensive. And instead of using power optimizers for shade mitigation, they just did less solar modules and more circuits so that the shade only impacted one circuit, not the others. And so if you only had three modules on a circuit, only three modules get impacted and not eight. And so a lot of your solar charge controllers that are available for off-grid are only 150 volt charge controllers. And if you use a grid tied high voltage solar module, that's common for what we would know as uh, the solar industry, 
you can only get about three modules a circuit. And so if I'm doing a, a 22 kilowatt solar array with 80 plus solar modules and I have three modules a circuit, I'm going to end up with 30 different circuits for my off-grid solar array. And if I put that on a roof, my wiring is just going to become a giant mess. You know, I suppose if you're doing a ground mount solar array, doing a bunch of wiring is no big deal. I suppose if you're doing a ground mount solar array and you have a bunch of wiring and a mouse comes and chews up some wires, losing one circuit out of 32 is better for risk mitigation. But my off-grid system's going up on a rooftop. You know, I don't want to spend all this time and do all this cable management, have it be a mess. I want my big, long 600 volt circuits. And so that actually made my uh, design selection a lot easier because out of all of these lists of companies that do and supply the off-grid market, only Schneider and Morningstar and Pika, and Pika is kind of a, a startup and Morningstar, you know, I just, uh, I just, they're not as, it's not to say that they don't make a quality product and are, aren't, aren't a good product to select, but they're just, they don't have the, the brand name recognition that say Schneider does, at least in the grid tie market. But what was, what was shocking to me is that Outback, which has a, a stellar reputation in the off-grid industry and SMA, which also has a stellar reputation in off-grid and even Magnum, none of these companies had a 600 volt or even today have a 600 volt charge controller. So if you wanna do long circuits like you're used to on battery-less solar arrays that really limited our product selection and was ultimately what, what ended up, we, we selected Schneider based on the fact that we wanted a charge controller to be made by the same company as the inverter because we wanted the charge controller and the inverter to work together flawlessly. You know, you'll, you'll actually run an ethernet cable between the charge controller and the inverter so they can communicate with each other. And so that's why we went with Schneider. Now, uh, since then, I've started to look at even more obscure battery inverter companies, uh, particularly ones that are not rated for grid connection. The Schneider inverter is rated for grid connection. Um, and so I've started to look at like European battery inverters and Australian battery inverters to try and find some that are cheaper for my clients that I know are going to be completely off grid. Another factor you want to look at is, are the inverters expandable? Because not all of them are. Usually, if you have a grid connected, capable battery inverter, it's going to be expandable. But sometimes the inverters that are designed uh, to be just purely off grid. So the, the company that that leaps to mind is one that's called Ames. So A-M-I-S is one that's not on this list. And their off-grid inverter is not listed for grid connection. And it's substantially cheaper than any of these companies. And it's a pure sine wave inverter with surge ratings and a lot of good features built into the cabinet. But it's not stackable. It's not expandable, which means that you know, their maximum inverter size is 12 kilowatts. And so if you're doing a, a higher end home, uh, you know, maybe that home's power demand with they have a swimming pool or uh, if they go and they do a, a tankless water heater, uh, they would not be able to, to use their, ex, their, they don't make a product that would serve that higher demand. So not all battery inverters are expandable. Out of, you know, we talked about combining multiple battery chemistries. Out of all of these inverters, only Pika said that it supports multiple battery chemistries. 
but I actually pressured them on that. And, and they were, they actually told me that they don't support multiple battery chemistries, that they have a lithium ion option and they have a lead acid option, but they don't let you do both at the same time. So that, that just puts them in the same category as, as everybody else. So we ended up going with Schneider. Um, you know, we, another factor is we went with two inverters and the main reason that we wanted two inverters. And again, that gets back into the expandability point where, you know, I really like Ames's price point, but I really like using two inverters rather than one inverter. Cause again, with off grid, you have to think about, well, if one inverter fails, you, you know, it's always nice to have, uh, uh, double redundancy built into your system uh, so that your failures don't become emergencies. So we went and we looked at our inverters and our charge controllers, and it turned out that Schneider had the best uh, brand recognition uh, with a 600 volt charge controller and a separate battery inverter. And so we went with them. Although I'd, I'd have to say the, the Schneider inverter is quite loud. So it has a transformer built into it and it, it, it does make a lot of noise. So you wouldn't want to put it outdoors. You wouldn't want to put it, you know, in a room that is like a, a laundry room. Now, I guess in a garage, it would be okay, but it, you know, in ours, we put it in a dedicated kind of control room inside the garage. You know, our 600 volt charge controllers, uh, we had eight circuits. And uh, originally we were thinking with eight circuits, we would put two in each charge controller. Uh, but then it turned out the, the charge controllers with Schneider could handle three circuits. And so we only, we, we got rid of one and we went with a circuit of three, a circuit of three and a circuit of two. And this was was kind of a a little bit of a controversial decision because our solar array was 22 kilowatts and each charge controller had an output of just under 5 kilowatts. And so if we had six three circuits, three circuits and then two circuits, you know, basically we had we had 5 kilowatts going into here and uh or I guess uh, 22, eight times three, and then nine kilowatts and nine kilowatts go into, into here and here. And so we grossly oversized the DC capacity input on the charge controller versus the DC capacity output. And if we, if we instead had gone with two circuits on each of these, they would have been better sized and we would have gotten more power output out of our system. The reason why that was okay is because what we're really concerned, the reason why we're doing that 22 kilowatt oversized array is that we're doing it specifically to produce more power on overcast days. And so when we're putting, you know, eight kilowatts or, you know, nine to, to nine kilowatts of DC capacity onto five kilowatts of DC output capacity, you know, on those overcast days, we're still only feeding it with four kilowatts of input and our output is five kilowatts. And so, you know, we're, we're oversizing the DC side of things specifically to produce more power on overcast days. And on those sunny days, we don't really have any use for the surplus power. Now, uh, if they added an electric vehicle or something like that, then we might go in and, and, and put in a, another charge controller and run those circuits over there. Now back on that battery bank size, what drove the 105 versus the 122? Well, Batteries, generally, you don't just have one battery 
plugged into your inverter. You know, even even this, you know, what is called a a 12 volt battery is inside the battery is comprised of multiple two volt batteries that that stack up to 12 volts. And so within the battery itself, you might have different what are called cells in the battery. And the thing is, if you have two batteries and they're plugged into the inverter, you get resistance out of these cables. And batteries are very sensitive to mismatches between these cables where uh, it's, it's best just to have one circuit of batteries so that the resistance across the cells is completely uniform. If you have a short, and by short, I mean the, the physical length of these battery cables, if you have a short circuit and then a longer circuit, you will get a mismatch in resistance between the two circuits, and that's going to cause the battery with more resistance to degrade faster than the one with less resistance. And that 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 initiates a response where uh, if you have different cells degrading at different rates, it, it causes the batteries to degrade all the all the more. And so, uh, you know, after talking with Schneider, they say, well, we actually allow you and support or sorry, when when talking with Hawker, the battery manufacturer, they say, well, we actually will warrant batteries of up to three circuits, but we don't support any more than three circuits of batteries going into one panel. And they they agreed that you know, the, the best is to have one. And then with two, generally with two batteries, you might have a rack where one battery is on top of the other so that the circuits are exactly the same length. You know, otherwise with two, you know, we just, we just made this battery cable physically longer and put a little bit of slack into it. But once you have three, you know, the... <laughs> You start getting into more and more variability between these cables themselves. And so to optimize our battery life, you know, the, the, the standard recommendation is to have no more than two battery circuits in your system per, you know, per battery bank. And then, and then the manufacturers, I guess not until you get into utility scale products, do you actually go and have multiple battery banks going into separate battery inverters or building a, a microgrid. You know, SMA has, then, then you get into utility scale selection where you might want to be specking out battery manufacturers that are suitable for microgrids. Um, because, say, Schneider uh, or Outback or Magnum, uh, they, they don't support microgrid configurations. SMA is, is a little bit better at supporting microgrid configurations out of the box. All right, so here's our chart of our battery. You know, our customer says, well, he wants to size the system so that he doesn't have to rely on the generator. In other words, he wants the system to work without a generator. And so we, we ended up with our 120 kilowatt battery bank by saying, okay, well, here's your consumption and here's your production. And we're adding them together for every single day and every single hour of the year. And so what we see is here's a, a winter storm cycle where the battery starts to deplete, but it's for like one, two, three, four, five days. And then the sun comes back up and we, we recover. Here's a summer storm cycle where we deplete for one, two, three days and then recover. And so we see that our, our in the summer, we're using more electricity 
than in the winter. Now, the, the customer could also say, oh, okay, well, I'm at a low end of my battery range, and so I need to not run uh, my air conditioner so high. You know, they could load shift and make some adjustments. But we also know that, you know, hey, this battery is operating down at the bottom end of its absorb range and getting into that lower end bulk range. Whereas here, we're operating at the top of the absorb range and into the float range and not really damaging our battery at all. So even though the system is sized to avoid generator use, we're still going to add a generator to the system. And then once the battery gets to the bottom of the absorb range, you know, even though the battery is rated for an 80% depth of discharge and it'll charge back up again, we want to avoid getting down to that bottom mark too often. And so what's more common is, you know, once the battery hits, say, a, a 50% or 60% threshold, instead to turn a generator on and, and charge the battery back up to the top again, so that it's running up to the top. That said, you know, gas is expensive, propane is expensive, generators are expensive. And so, you know, you may want to model your generator usage and your generator runtime just to make sure you're not, you know, trading the grid connection costs for a higher gas bill, especially if the house doesn't plan on already having uh, a gas tank to begin with. And so this got us into the concept of, of modeling how many times we're actually starting the generator. Uh, say we're, we were comparing a smaller battery bank to a larger battery bank, you know, with a smaller battery bank with a deeper cycle, you know, okay, well, well, that means we can we can use more of the range of the battery without damaging it. But then we also get to the bottom of our battery bank more frequently. And that means we're going to have to turn the generator on more frequently because we, we simply have less time. You know, we might only be able to go three days without turning the generator on instead of five days without turning the generator on. And so based off how many times per year we're charging the battery all the way back up to the top, the customer may be more likely to say, okay, well, let's add some more storage capacity or more array capacity uh, because I don't want to worry about uh, running out of gas and then running out of electricity. And so I think uh, uh, you know, one way we, we said, okay, well, how do we choose between a larger flooded lead acid battery size versus a smaller nickel iron battery size or lithium ion battery size where with the flooded lead acid we are trying to uh, keep it above a 50 percent depth of discharge or even 30 percent depth of discharge whereas with lithium ion we could discharge it by a hundred percent or with nickel iron we could discharge it by 80 percent how do we how do we figure out the, the trade-off, you know, I think a good way to figure it out is to count how many times a year you need to turn the generator on and say, okay, if I'm going down to 80% consistently, how many times a year going down to 80% do I turn the generator on versus if I'm only going down to 50% before I turn the generator on, how many times a year is that range? And then just just count them up and compare them to each other. And so that's how we got like, OK, uh, um, you know, if I'm using a, a 122 kilowatt hour where I'm turning the generator on at 50 percent, then I could do a 77 kilowatt where I'm only turning the generator on at 80 percent instead of 50 percent. Kind of, uh, you know, if you if you model your comparative battery technologies based off your generator runtime uh, and you set the generator runtime equal to each other, 
you know, that's a that's a good kind of similar user experience for uh, this size of premium batteries versus that size of less expensive uh, but shallower cycle batteries. And so, for instance, with our with our uh, you know with our our flooded lead acid batteries, you know they say okay, well the we we don't recommend cycling them more than sixty five percent, but they're rated for a minimum of eighty percent, and so don't cycle them ever below eighty percent. But as far as regular operating, you can take them all the way down to 65%. And so we turn the generator on at 50% just to be on the safe side. But we came up with that 120 kilowatt hour mark by modeling every hour of the day and then getting down to uh, the bottom saying, okay, well, what's our biggest deficit in our battery bank for the entire year before the solar array before the solar array recovers the battery and that biggest deficit would then reflect 80% of our battery size and that biggest deficit was like 100 kilowatt hours and so our battery bank needed to be 120 kilowatt hours So now we're getting into battery spec sheets. And this is for two different kinds of flooded lead acid. We have a, a premium line, and then we have an ultra premium line, which is the industrial line. So industrial flooded lead acid is the, the top shelf flooded lead acid. And then there's a premium line, and then there's even in this particular manufacturer a renewable line that is less premium than the premium line. And then you get into like your your marina batteries or golf cart batteries or even your car batteries. So what's interesting about this is if we're if we're limited to two circuits of batteries and our battery inverter is 48 volts then we start to become limited in our product selection on what the maximum size of our battery can be because like here's in our industrial line we got some six volt batteries at uh you know let's say for their their 20 hour discharge rate 12,700 amp hours at four volts or 925 amp hours at six volts, you know, 464, 695, 925. You know, the way that I would, would peg this battery bank is I, you know, again, pulling up my calculator, you know, let's do this, this six volt battery right here. You know, we're gonna do 925 amp hours times six volts is, 5,550 watt hours divided by a thousand, you know, each one of these uh, six volt, 925 amp hour batteries contains 5.5 kilowatt hours. And if my battery bank is 48 volts, well, six times eight is 48. So going back to my calculator, I can have eight of these batteries. Well, that's 44 kilowatt hours. And if I can only have two circuits of them, that's 88 kilowatt hours. Well, that's not enough. I need 120. And so what that means for this particular manufacturer, for this particular battery, you know, this, this six volt, battery is not going to be good enough and now i have to say okay well what about my four volt battery <laughs> you know you do the same calculation it's it's a four volt battery and that means per 48 volt circuit i can have 12 of them and i have two circuits so that's going to be 24 batteries at 
four volts and at 1520 amp hours divided by a thousand okay that's 145 and so i don't have that 122 kilowatt option i have a i have a 88 kilowatt option and then i have a 145 kilowatt option and so the, and, and that's it i don't have a 122 kilowatt option and so in this particular we didn't end up going with this manufacturer but that was you know that was kind of one of the the things that we bumped up against is we were starting to get into the maximum capacity of this of what we could actually score i mean for this this particular manufacturer you know let's go and do their their two volt battery so we go two volts well it's um 48 divided by two that's 24 batteries per circuit there's two circuits that's 48 batteries they're at two volts each and then uh 18,849 amp hours divided by a thousand you know that pretty much says is the the very tippy top shelf of this uh manufacturer's product line for our off-grid system if we wanted to keep our batteries to two circuits the most the maximum capacity we would be able to have is 177 kilowatt hours and so that's uh you know when you're doing um luxury homes you know if my home was twice the size as the home for this doctor and i needed twice the batteries i'm not even sure i would have been able to find a battery that would have fit within this two circuit configuration i might have had to start dividing up my electrical systems or forming some or selecting say the a different inverter that supported microgrid formation so i could have a, a solar array and a battery bank over there and a solar array and battery bank over there and and you know not you know oh i would only say that sma out of the the non you know non-commercial non-industrial battery inverters really supports microgrid uh formation right now and then uh at the same time you look at the uh premium line versus the industrial line and their two volt battery can only contain 1100 amp hours rather than for the same discharge rate uh 1849 and so the the premium line was too puny to handle the job now there's another thing to take note of on this chart we have a, a five hour rate a 10 hour rate a 20 hour rate and a hundred hour rate well, what's up with that what does that mean well, what we see is that as we go from 100 hours to 20 hours, 20 hours to 10 hours, 10 hours to 5 hours, the amp hour capacity of the battery drops. You know, what I've what I've done and I don't have it in your your course handout. I've actually gone in modeled this let me pull up a, a different slide real quick so i went in let's see here we go so i went and i i plotted this on a graph to show the the uh discharge rate of how quickly we discharge and in, in this case it's discharging the battery over a hundred hours versus discharging the battery over 20 hours versus 10 hours versus five hours and you get kind of this this logarithmic or or uh yeah like a logarithmic decay curve and it really starts to drop off the map right around a two hour discharge rate where what you can see is it's like, okay, well, sure, a five day 
uniform discharge rate. Well, that's not very realistic for off grid. I mean, our days are are 24 hours long. So at a bare minimum, when you're doing your battery capacity size, you want to use the 20 hour discharge rate. So we're really over here in our battery capacity. We wouldn't we wouldn't really ever model the hundred hour. Well, then actually, you know, maybe we're not, you know, when we did our model, we divided our consumption by 24, but really we might be using uh, two thirds of our power during the day and only one third of our power at night. You know, our loads vary. So you wouldn't be unwise to model your array at the 10 hour discharge rate anyway which would mean if you're draining your battery faster, you have even less capacity out of it. And then if you drain your battery capacity in two hours, you know, you, you start to, you know, if you turn on that tankless water heater that has a 20 kilowatt draw, you could completely brick your battery within a, a two hour time. And so the, the thing to keep in mind when you're doing your, your off-grid home is that if you're designing your battery bank around a 20 hour discharge rate, you want to keep your power draw as even as possible. And if you're not really being wise to your energy management and load management, you know, it, it might be that your power draw is, is underperforms because if your solar array is on, and you're drawing the power out of your solar production and, and not out of your batteries, well, then this really isn't an issue. But if you're just charging your battery bank with your solar array and then getting home and then plugging in your electric vehicle and starting the laundry and cooking dinner all at the same time, and you're you know, you're not going to be depleting your battery bank over 20 hours. You're going to be depleting your battery bank over 10 hours or over five hours. And if you really go and turn on all your electrical devices in your entire home, you know, it, it could be possible that you're sucking so much power out of your home all at once that you drain your batteries much more rapidly. And I think that's what really scares people away from flooded lead acid more than anything else is, is they're, they're not used to managing their power. And so they're afraid of using all of their load at once. And so what you really want to do is, is make sure that you are, are able to view your your consumption in real time in your home, which is easier to do now than it ever has been. You know, you can put monitoring systems on your cell phone and be able to, to, to see what your power draw of your home is. You know, I'm not too concerned about this. You know, the, the fact is, uh, off-grid with lithium ion today is still very expensive you know your your customers who want to go off-grid have really no other pragmatic choice than to do flooded lead acid at this time and so they they have to manage their uh, energy use and that means when you pick out your devices you want to pick out a variable speed air conditioner so not an air conditioner that clicks on and clicks off and clicks on and clicks off but an air conditioner that operates at a lower power level more consistently throughout the day. You know, that means that when you buy, it doesn't mean that you don't buy electronic devices, but another thing to think about is, you know, now you have a lot of power in the middle of the day and not a lot of power at night. And so that doesn't mean that you have no electricity, what that means is you want to use that power in the middle of the day wisely. You know, that, that really gets us into things like putting thermal mass in the home so that you can chill the thermal mass in the middle of the day and then not run the air conditioner as much at night. You know, what I tell my clients is, well, look, you have a, a deep freeze. You know, put that deep freeze on a timer. 
and run the deep freeze during the day and let it coast at night. And that might actually mean you buy two deep freezes instead of one deep freeze. And you fill the, the bottom of each deep freeze with milk jugs that have water in them. And so you freeze blocks of ice inside the deep freeze. And so you freeze ice in the middle of the day and then you let it coast off its thermal mass at night. And so it doesn't necessarily mean you buy fewer appliances. It actually might mean that you buy more appliances. You just use them in a more intelligent manner. You know, so, so just doing the, the math and comparing some of these, these numbers, you know, a, a f industrial flooded lead acid battery bank might have 12 cents a kilowatt hour at a C20 discharge rate, but at a C2 discharge rate, that could jump up to be 19 cents a kilowatt hour, which wouldn't make it any more cost effective than the, the Tesla Powerwall. So getting back into the program slides, You know, here we, uh, we, we changed up our battery manufacturer. You know, instead of looking at the, the renewable solar battery suppliers like Trojan and Rolls and Hawk and, um, and Crown, we actually started looking at industrial flooded lead acid battery manufacturers, uh, found a, one in Hawker, and we ended up going with this battery, um, this battery right here. No, it's it this one. And uh, the only problem that we kind of experienced, and these batteries are large, you know, they're they're three feet long by a foot wide um, by two feet tall. And the real problem that we run into with industrial flooded lead acid is the batteries weigh so dang much. You know, what, what happened is we, we got a battery crane to move the batteries around on the job site. Now the, the client actually was buying this because he had a safe in the house. And so he used the battery crane to move the safe around too. And so it, it had more than, more than one use. But... <laughs> What happened is we ordered eight of these batteries. So they were they were 12 volts each. And so that was, you know, four batteries per circuit. And it was two circuits. Well, the, the battery manufacturer shipped them four to a pallet. And so that meant our pallet weighed 4,000 pounds. And for those involved in shipping logistics, most lift gates only support 3,000 pounds. So we had to go and rent a $1,000 artic off-road articulating uh, forklift in order to just offload the batteries from the moving truck uh, and, and, and take them off of the, the shipment. And so I, you know, in, in hindsight, you know, I might have uh, been should have told the the shipper to pack them on three pallets instead of two and that we would pay the difference in shipping so that we could have lowered them off the truck uh in a in a easier manner than than what how they arrived packed on site so you have to be a little bit careful when you're buying industrial flooded lead acid because of the shipping logistics and that may be a reason not to go with industrial flooded lead acid. That may be a reason to go with the the renewable batteries, the the smaller, you know, maybe less cost effective, less upfront cost, less productive life. But it, it just might be that you need a battery that only weighs a hundred pounds or even fifty pounds, depending on uh, the logistics of your job site. So let's see, looking at some code requirements for our battery room, I'm kind of speeding up some of the, the content in the interest of time. Uh, I want to talk about some installation requirements to keep in mind. 
you know, this stuff takes up more space than your standard solar equipment. You know, if you're doing a, a double redundant system, now you have two inverters. And the, the solar industry is so advanced now that they've gotten into smaller and smaller inverter sizes. And the inverters have shrunk dramatically over the last decade. But your battery inverter companies are still there with big, large cabinets that are easy to wire because you're doing a lot of the internal wiring yourself, which I like, but they do take up space. You know, we bought a, a custom service panel for our battery system. It was made by Schneider. And what's interesting about this service panel is it has a AC side for our inverter output to land on and our generator to land on and then to feed our main service panel for our home. But then it also has a DC side for the charge controllers to land on and then for our battery banks to land on. So this has a, an AC side to it and a DC side to it. Uh, kind of a, a funny story, these uh, very large DC breakers are specialty breakers. You know, you go to Lowe's and you can buy breakers at Lowe's, or you go to your electrical supply store, you can buy breakers at your electrical supply store. You can't find high amperage DC breakers anywhere other than online because no one has DC circuits of any sufficient ampacity other than if you're doing off-grid battery banks. And so originally we bought these breakers from Schneider and I made a mistake because these were 80 amp charge controllers and I ordered 80 amp breakers and I really needed to, to oversize them. I needed to order 100 amp breakers and not 80 amp breakers. And so we installed them and on the heat drops your voltage and it increases your amperage. And so as we got into the summer, we got into um, hot days where the array was at full capacity and uh, the charge controllers that had three circuits on them rather than two circuits were tripping their breakers. And so at that point, it's like, okay, well, I really need to fix this. I need to swap it out with 100 amp breakers. It, it shows you the nice thing about having redundant systems because, you know, while this breaker tripped, this breaker remained on. So the customer didn't run out of power while we were fixing the problem. Uh, but... <laughs> The problem with these breakers and the reason why we didn't we didn't just fix them immediately, I guess we should have, but you know, the breakers were costing, you know, eighty dollars each because they're specialty breakers. And I just I just didn't want to spend, you know, the three hundred dollars on on going and getting the the more expensive hundred amp breakers, which were even more expensive than these eighty amp breakers. I didn't want to spend the money unless we actually saw the charge controllers getting up to their full rated capacity, which eventually they did. So I did some pricing online and I looked up the original equipment manufacturer of these DC breakers and I was able to find uh, a six breaker unit of six 100 amp single pole DC breakers and the entire unit cost me 50 bucks because it came out of some other piece of equipment that required DC breakers. And I guess they didn't need it anymore and they were selling the breakers off on eBay. But if I had bought them directly from my solar supplier, it would have cost me 300 because that's the cost of the breaker from Schneider and not from the original equipment manufacturer. So you have to be careful when you're buying these specialty products because uh, sometimes you you really overpay for what you get. You know, it's it's more of an elegance thing than uh, than than anything else. Because 
you know, it may be that you find a, a service panel that's rated for your appropriate DC voltage, and then you find a breaker that's rated for AC or DC voltage. And by having two service panels and piecing it, piecing it all together yourself, if you have enough electrical knowledge to do so, you can dramatically reduce your balance of system cost. So here's another problem we ran into. The charge controllers and the inverters stick out from the wall by six inches, but our batteries stuck out from the wall by three feet, which means we could not put this equipment above the batteries on the wall because there's a National Electric Code rule that says your electric equipment can't stick out more than six inches from each other. The idea being that you don't have to reach over the battery to service it. Similarly, these battery cells need to be serviced. And what happens is every couple of weeks, you have to water the batteries and watering the batteries is really easy. You take a, a watering container and you plug it into the side and all of the cells are have a watering system that interconnects them. And it's almost like you take a super soaker and you squeeze the trigger and you just fill the batteries up with water and they all they all fill up and stop when they're they're full. Watering the batteries is very easy but then you have to unscrew a little cap on each battery and then take a device almost like a thermometer and stick it into the battery and monitor, measure its specific gravity. And so on the first year, you do that with the first group of batteries. And then the second year, you do it with the second group. The third year, you do it with the third group. And so you, you actually have these rotated 90 degrees the wrong way. So you work your way backwards through the battery each time. So the maintenance process really only takes 15 minutes every two weeks. But what it means is that, you know, really all sides of the battery have to be accessible. And so that's the, the main kind of code violation you run into with these batteries is that, that if you put them up against a wall, you could have an inspector that comes in and says, hey, these are vented batteries and you're going to have to access that battery that's in this corner up against the wall and or you're going to have to reach over these batteries in order to measure the specific gravity and the batteries in the back. And so you really need to be able to walk completely around your vented batteries. Whereas with sealed batteries, you don't have that maintenance uh, requirement. And so actually this picture, this picture and, and our, our final layout here even this final layout where we can access the batteries on the side, you know, technically an inspector could um, fail us because we didn't, you know, these back batteries are not accessible. Okay, kind of moving along. Um, I'm not going to talk about the solar racking because this is a battery class, although I think one cool thing that we did on this project is it was a standing seam metal rooftop, and we drilled out the 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 z purlin uh, and and went into the z purlin and then went into the roof cap uh, from the top. And so that's how we did our internal conduit run, and it worked out real real slick. You know, here was our budget. Um, we bought three pallets of modules. Cost about 12,000 bucks. Our racking system, 
are, you know, the inverter system, this is where I'm, I'm looking for cheaper solutions for off-grid because by the time we bought the $1,000 specialty distribution panel and then we, uh, you know, our charge controllers and then all the, the add-on kits and the accessories, you know, the, it's the, the inverter system ends up costing about a dollar a watt, whereas with a battery-less solar inverter, they usually cost around 30 cents per watt. And so the, the inverters are much more expensive. We spent about, uh, actually our, our quote came in under this. We spent about $22,000 on our battery bank. And so our all-in system cost uh, came in to be about 75000 bucks in material for this customer to go off-grid. He installed it himself and he saved the, the cost of bringing power out to the property. And so he got his payback on his system. Originally, we modeled the, the batteries at having a 12-year a life. However, now I use a, a software for providing more detail on battery cycle life. And uh, it turns out that the batteries are going to last a lot longer than, than 11 years. So uh, you, can, you can look at these budgets and, and send me an email if you have questions about them. But I want to kind of finish on coming back to commercial sizing. I'm going to put in my uh, email address so you can shoot me an email after class if you have questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm also, I'm happy to answer questions after class, but I do run a, a Slack group. Um, so I'm going to send out the invite link to that real quick. If you don't use Slack, uh, it's a lot of fun, actually. So um, here's my Slack community kind of, uh, it's, it's very useful for corporate messaging. So you can communicate with me and other students that way. I post course videos and follow up and course updates in the Slack group. So if you want additional updates and stuff, you can go there. You know, it would have been in the customer's best financial interest to remain grid connected. But at the end of the day, he said... I don't want the power lines running across the property. I just don't want to see them. You know, it's going off grid for him. Even at a $18,000 grid connection fee, it was still a, a lifestyle choice. You know, of course, that was two years ago. And now I know a lot more, too, about it. You know, what I would say for a, a typical home you know, you don't really need that 122 kilowatt hour battery bank uh, as a as a standard battery bank size for a standard home off grid. I recommend about 90 kilowatt hours. It gives you about three days of runtime before you need to crank the generator. And again, by oversizing the battery that large, you're getting into a, more of a C20 discharge rate rather than a C10 or a C5. So you, you know, you buy yourself insurance of, you know, making sure the customer isn't abusing the batteries by just the simple fact that the battery bank is large enough to run the load for a longer period of time. But really what I want to want to want to kind of finish with is uh you know on spec sheets and stuff but I want to finish with um you know what these are are our little control systems to monitor the battery voltage and turn the generator on when the battery voltage drops below a specific level this is a, a battery temperature sensor where in cold weather, you don't want the batteries to freeze. 
And so the way that you prevent the batteries from freezing when it's below temperature is to make sure that they remain at a uh, 50 percent state of charge or higher. And that's that's another thing about lead acid compared to, say, lithium ion is they can take temperature extremes better than lithium ion. So you kind of have to put lithium ion in an air conditioned environment. It's a good idea to put your battery bank in an air conditioned environment, but it's not a, it's not an essential requirement. Um, You know, one thing that's kind of interesting about the, the Tesla Powerwall is it's only rated for 10 amps of output. So even if you're using the Tesla Powerwall to provide backup power during a blackout, it's not going to provide you with hardly anything more than one power outlet worth of power. And so, uh, you know, the pro you know, one problem with doing a small lithium ion battery by itself is it's not going to give you a good supply of backup power. Really, what you're using that small lithium ion battery for is to support your solar array so that you have a lot of power during the day and a little bit of power at night. Anyway, we're we're out of time, so I have uh you know all this stuff is just screenshots from installation manuals. You know what I want to what I want to end on. This is just more budget information. What I want to end on is the the commercial modeling software capability where what we did in Excel was do a lot of assumptions like we were assuming the the power draw from our building but when you get into commercial modeling software you're actually loading in that interval data and when you actually load in the interval data from the building and the actual production from your solar array you can get the exact uh, degrad, you know, energy decay rates and performance of the battery. So the exact discharge rates from the battery. And by doing that, by modeling, not just assuming your average depth of discharge, but knowing exactly how many kilowatt hours and at what depth of discharge come out of your battery, you can actually get the true life cycle out of the battery. And so there's a, a software that is worth playing around with called Energy Toolbase. So it's Energy Toolbase. That is, uh, it's a paid software, so I don't go too much into it in, the, uh, in this class, but it's definitely the, the market leader of commercial modeling, and it does economic analysis. Um, and it does, it basically combines the PV watts data and your, allows you to put in a battery bank size. And the real value of Energy Toolbase is that it provides these sorts of graphs naturally for you so that you don't need to model it yourself in Excel. And, uh, and things like you know, it, it provides you with charts and analysis to say, okay, well, once you start getting into a larger battery bank, how far can you go before you get into diminishing returns? And so it, it'll take your, your energy savings and your demand savings and then apply them together to say, okay, well, your facility, you could use up to 150 kilowatt hours of battery capacity. But really, if you go with a 86 kilowatt array instead, that's going to be the more cost effective configuration. And so uh, it really, you know, we can see that maybe for, for off grid modeling where you're overshooting and being conservative, hacking together your own battery size model between PV watts, your monthly data, and Excel can get you there. But for commercial demand management, 
where it's much more important to know what your discharge rate is uh, and what the hardcore demand savings and economics are. Uh, the the energy tool base is it gives you that level of granularity uh, and exactness. So I've put in some some screenshots uh, from that. Uh, let's see, closing things out. Uh, Tesla, they say that their cost is around $200 a kilowatt hour for lithium ion. I have not personally seen that in the market. You know, by the time you get to the